Thank you for allowing me to be here. This is great. Uh, my job is to talk about outcomes assessment following a variety of bariatric procedures, particularly in the uh, realm of reflux. No disclosures. So we all know that uh, reflux and GERD are very common in obesity, as are anatomic abnormalities such as hiatal hernia. There's a lot of abnormal physiology. We often find abnormal endoscopic and radiologic findings before surgery, but the preoperative workup of bariatric patients is quite variable and quite controversial, so not everybody does these tests. If you look at the literature on GERD after weight loss surgery, very few studies actually use objective data to even define reflux, and few of those studies correlate improvement of GERD with weight loss, and very few of the studies actually have long-term data, so it's, it's hard to interpret. In, 19, uh, in 2015, the ASMBS Clinical Issues Committee generated a guideline that was published on standardized outcomes procedure reporting of uh, the various um, weight-related comorbidities. And in the section on GERD, they made some good points, which is we should use a validated questionnaire both before and after surgery about GERD. We should record and report medication use, how much medication is used, why it's being used, and there should be a minimum of one year of follow-up of these patients and preferably longer-term follow-up to see what's going on. And in that same report, they, they talked about the differences between uh, improvement versus complete resolution, and some of that is subjective, and it's just the reporting of patients on whether they're still having symptoms of GERD. But some objective things include how much medication they're using or is medication eliminated, and in particular, uh, improved or now normalized studies such as pH probe, in particular impedance testing and endoscopy. These things are all important to include if you're going to write a paper on resolution of GERD after weight loss surgery. Uh, we all know that the gastric bypass is really the best operation for patients with obesity and GERD. And uh, that's for a number of reasons, one of which is less uh, abdominal pressure because of weight loss. There's very minimal acid production in a small pouch. Bile is diverged. It, it's, it's completely, di di it's, di it's diverged from the esophagus, so you don't have that going on. And with the small pouch and rapid emptying, there's not a lot of regurgitation in bypass patients. So um, this subjective improvement that we see in bypass patients is also confirmed with uh, manometry, pH studies, and radiologic studies. So we know this is true. This was a paper uh, reporting on the BOLD database, and they looked specifically at GERD, and they used a composite grading score that you see here. And what they found in their uh, assessment of all of these patients was at least 56% of bypass patients saw significant improvement of GERD after surgery, and this was much better than what was seen after the adjustable gastric band or the sleeve gastrectomy. And this leads to the question of why doesn't reflux completely go away after the gastric bypass? Well, there's a number of reasons for that. Pouch size is variable. Some people make a tiny pouch the size of your thumb. Some people have a much larger pouch, so there's more acid-producing cells. Uh, some people are left with a gastrogastric fistula at the time of surgery because there's incomplete division of the stomach, and some people develop a gastrogastric fistula later on, which will lead to acid reflux. There isn't any standardization in the alimentary limb length, and some programs are still using quite short alimentary limbs, and these patients can be a setup for bile reflux. And uh, there are some patients with some tightness of the stomal output, and uh, they will have sort of a brackish backwash. It may not necessarily be acidic, but patients uh, perceive this as reflux and complain about it. So in terms of Barrett's esophagus, Generally speaking, Barrett's in a bypass patient will improve, and sometimes we see complete regression of Barrett's. And uh, in terms of progression of Barrett's or worsening of it, it is almost never seen. But these patients do need to continue having endoscopic uh, follow-up for life. Regarding the band, there are very conflicting studies, as was said by uh, Dr. Shaw. Uh, 
Uh, some of them are short-term studies, and they often show complete improvement, and this is because there's an early barrier effect at the GE junction just on the part of the band, and many of these patients also have a concomitant hiatal hernia repair, so this is why a lot of these patients feel better immediately. But then if you look at the longer-term studies, <laughs> as many as 50% of band patients will de novo develop GERD. So I think the bottom line here is that the band is probably not the best choice for most patients who start out with significant GERD symptoms, and in fact, most programs are getting away from using the band in general. If you look at the sleeve, there's similar, very conflicting data on what's going on. Uh, Dr. Shaw referred to this uh, systematic review of the 15 studies, and four showed an increase in GERD, and seven shows decrease, and three of those studies only looked at preoperative data. I'm not sure why they were included in the systematic review, so uh, we're still confused about what's going on. There's also conflicting data, and there are reports on whether uh, concomitant hiatal hernia repair will prevent patients from having GERD after sleeve gastrectomy, and some of them show that it is improved, but many of them shows that there's actually no difference whether you uh, repair a hiatal hernia concurrently or not. Um, I happen to believe that the shape, the size, and the 3D geometry of the sleeve itself is absolutely crucial in what's going to happen with patients long term uh, in terms of GERD. And this is just an illustration. Uh, if you have a mid-body stricture of your sleeve, these patients are going to have reflux. If you have twisting of the sleeve, this leads to a functional stricture, and that will be just the same as if it's a real stricture. If patients are left with a lot of excessive fundus, that's a lot of acid-producing uh, cells, and those patients will have reflux. And if you don't leave much of the antral musculature, you're not going to be able to propel gastric contents through the pylorus. And in fact, anything that uh, impinges on the pylorus is going to be a problem for patients. And it's important to remember to preserve those uh, sling fibers of Helvetius, however he pronounced it. And uh, you're not going to do uh, a, an anatomic dissection of your patient's stomach. You have to take out the whole outer portion of the stomach to see these fibers. But really what it shows is that if you stay a little bit away from the esophagus and then you leave yourself a good portion of antrum, you're likely to maintain most of those fibers of Helvetius, which are really uh, a, a very important part of the lower esophage esophageal sphincter function. So it's, it's great to preserve as many of those as possible. This is uh, somebody I inherited from another institution, and this patient had a very small sleeve, and on top of that, the uh, proximal, the uh, staple line, which is usually conventionally about six centimeters from the uh, uh, pylorus, this staple line went not only across the pylorus, it continued on to the first portion of the duodenum. So this patient was left with a very narrow sleeve and absolutely no antrum with which to propel contents, and he had a big blowout at the angle of his and was very sick for some time and uh, that required a lot of time to fix. So I think we can conclude that the sleeve is probably controversial in the face of patients who already have significant GERD. Uh, it is at least relatively contraindication in patients with Barrett's esophagus, pre-existing Barrett's. Um, there was a study that, uh, an abstract that was shown at IFSO in 2014, and this was really scary. Uh, this was an Italian group, and they uh, scoped all of their sleeve patients post-operatively, and what they found was fully a 17% rate of formation of Barrett's in their patients uh, at a time point of at least 51 months, mean, mean 51 months after surgery. And this was horrifying. Uh, the one thing that was left out was these patients were not scoped preoperatively, so we really don't know what the Barrett's rate was in their particular population. There's a somewhat uh, more controlled study that was done uh, by Brighetto and his group, and they looked at a set of sleeve patients with a limited BMI range of 35 to 45. They eliminated anybody who had preoperative reflux, and then they scoped every single patient preoperatively, and they eliminated anybody who had esophagitis, erosion, hiatal hernia, or the presence of Barrett's esophagus. So these were theoretically normal patients in terms of GERD. And so they got a validated questionnaire 
and an endoscopy at one month and 12 months after surgery. And at 12 months, 23% of their patients were already complaining about reflux. And 15% of them already had erosive esophagitis. And the scariest part is 1.2% of them had developed Barrett's esophagus at one year. So this was troubling to me. Uh, I went back and I uh, looked at some of their earlier studies where they told what their uh, method was. And these, uh, this group used a 34 French bougie. And they started their staple line at 2 to 3 centimeters from the pylorus. So I have to reiterate that you should probably use a somewhat larger bougie. You got to stay away from impingement on the pylorus, and you really need to leave some of that antral musculature to get stuff through the pylorus. In essence, uh, I think the sleeve is maybe controversial in the face of GERD. Uh, it's relatively contraindicated in patients with known preoperative Barrett's esophagus. Uh, if you have patients who absolutely refuse to have a gastric bypass, even with these factors, you might add radiofrequency ablation of the lower esophageal sphincter or to add a device that gives you some, some barrier function there at the GE junction uh, for those who, who still want it. And just remember that patients still can have bile reflux through the pylorus, and this may be perceived as reflux or GERD in these patients. Um, I'll, I'll end with uh, Michelle Gagné's editorial that came out uh, a few months ago in Obesity Surgery, looking at whether sleeve gastrectomy should be absolutely contraindicated in patients who have pre-existing uh, Barrett's. And his point was well taken, which is that we've been doing the sleeve gastrectomy as part of the duodenal switch since at least 1984. So since that time, it's, it's more than, it's about 30 years, and there are no reports of esophageal adenocarcinoma after duodenal switch. And so I think a lot of our worry about GERD and Barrett's and sleeve patients uh, may be excessive. I think it's still, it's still a uh, reasonable, reasonable procedure for a lot of patients. So thank you.